All right. Are we live? I think so. Here we go. Squeaky chair. So, I have got a new template put together. Well, it's actually my other template. It's a new one, but I transferred all the stuff from the previous session, the initial sketch, the markers, time switches, uh, tempo, ch there are no tempo changes, but to all that good stuff. So, let's get started. Today, I'm going to focus a lot more on just doing some actual orchestrating. All right, so I'm not going to be as attentive to the questions as I have been in the past couple episodes. You are more than free to ask. I oh, I will definitely do my best to keep answering and keep talking. But today, I want to make some solid progress on this piece. All right, so here are our notes. Another few low strings. You know what? Let's, let's delete all of this, except for the energy levels. I know we had a whole video dedicated to this, but this is just a... Uh, things work out sometimes. Let's see here, delete all this. Let's take a much more holistic approach. All right, energy level four. So this is some of the lowest energy, not the lowest energy in the entire series. Let's give it a listen to real quick to see what we're working with. A reminder, what's the material in this first section? Ah, this, move that over here. Or that probably is supposed to go there, isn't it? There we go. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Like I said, I'm going to start focusing more on taking my actual approach to this kind of stuff in this video. So first section. What emotion do I want to try and capture? That's my first thought. The primary material here is the melody. So I want to think, what emotion do I want to try and capture here? Uh, this is low energy. It is a hero's theme, so it should be somewhat... It's kind of heroic. Um, it's a bit of an adventure theme. We can start off slow. Let's look here again. Moderate to fast-paced. Melody fragmented done. Um, so these are some of the notes that we had way early in the series. Um, you know, let's just stick to my gut real quick. So what emotion do I want it to hear? So, so I want it to be serious. I want it to be a bit somber, but optimistic. All right? I want this to be like a little bit, it sounds low energy to me a little bit. And that's because we have, or not low energy, but we've got that E minor to the G major to C major. That sounds to me very somber, to a certain degree. Uh, hey, how's it going? Got some people on there. How's it going, Mark? Good to see you as always. Same with you, Trash uh, Trash Pizza. It's been a while. I haven't seen you on the last couple live ones, my friend. But let's see here. So what kind of emotion am I going for here? So a bit on the somber side. I want it to be intimate. During the climax of this piece, I do plan on going big, bombastic, John Williams-style horns and stuff. I want this to be a bit more intimate. But serious. So let's see here. So what emotional is somber? Uh, intimate, serious. All right. So next thing I want to do is what kind of instruments can actually do this? So trumpet. Let's see. Instruments can accomplish this. Trumpet, I'm thinking flute. Um, so we're going for somber, intimate, serious. Intimate, I'm always thinking woodwinds. So let's say clarinet as well. I, I For whatever reason, oboe and bassoon aren't hitting me that well right now. Maybe horn. Ah, oh, piano could definitely do it. So now I'm going through just different things I know about the different instruments, trying to figure out which potential instruments could do this. Because I'm thinking for this melody, I want to introduce a solo. I want to introduce it intimately with a solo instrument. So I've got some good options here. we got trumpet, flute, clarinet, horn, and or piano. So the next thing I want to do is look at the range of this melody. All right, so we go from a B above middle C all the way to a D above high C. That's a little high for the trumpet 
right off the bat. Now, the trumpet can do that. Of course, there are, especially talented players, can do that no problem whatsoever. But my main issue here is that is in the trumpet's higher register. And so the trumpet's higher register is fantastic for climaxes. If I waste it right off in the beginning here, then there's no big reveal later where I can introduce that as material. So I'm going to say no to the trumpet, especially because I could drop it an octave. But then we would have it in the low register for the trumpet, and I don't know, maybe, maybe, let's see it. Uh, let's go find a trumpet. Let's do trumpet solo one. Let's open this. There we go, got my trumpet solo up, got my keyboard working. Let's give this a try. Maybe. I actually kind of like that. I don't care much for this particular trumpet solo, though. Let's try what the other one sounds like, because Spitfire does give you the option of two different trumpet solos in this library. Let's give it a look. I really, it's been a long time since I've looked at this um, library's manual. I should probably check that out. Uh, make sure I understand what the actual differences are. That could work. It could work. Better than I anticipated. So we'll keep trumpet as an option. Next, let's do flute. Well, let's look at this range again. So up here, this would be about the flute's mid-register. The mid-register for the flute is a very uh, lyrical sounding. Uh, or no, it's, it's a pretty, like, all right, how do I put this? So the flute has three registers, about three octaves, approximately. The lowest register is very intimate and very soft. It's good for solos, but it's not doesn't have a lot of power. So it's very intimate, very rich. Mid register is very sweet, very lyrical, and the top register isn't very useful for uh, solos. It's great for other things, but for solos, it tends to be a bit piercing and shrill. Um, so this would be the sweet and lyrical. Don't know if that's what I'm going for. I would like to have the low and rich sound, but... I don't, that would be tricky to work around. Let's turn this off. So let's see how that would, but there is a solution. We can do an alto flute, which is a bit lower than the flute. It could still play within that low register area, but have a nice, a little bit more power to it. Let's try here. I, I do like this. Alright, so I like the flute better. So trumpet, knocking the trumpet out. Oh, that pains me. I love the trumpet. But I like the alto flute. Let's try an octave higher. I like that too. All right, so the flute is looking pretty good. Let's try a clarinet. Again, going with the range it's in, let's try a bass clarinet. Let's see how this could help. Uh, I've been having issues with melodies. Ah, yes, uh, I've been having issues. Uh, Trashby says I've been having issues with melodies and rhythm. Hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Um, how does note length work if it's 16th to 8th, quarter, quarter, note, half, or whole, or you can just mix them how you want? Uh, so yes, so with the note values, that has more to do with just each individual note. So I'll actually give you a little 
look here. It doesn't have to do with what any order. These are just like the identifying. So um, we'll see. How do I put this? Um, it's like having an alphabet. All right, the alphabet doesn't have rules saying that like A always has to come after B or something like that whenever you write a word. All right, you can have them in any order. So a quarter note. You've got a quarter note, typically that's equal to one beat. Then got an eighth note, which is equal to two quarter notes. You've got a sixteenth note, which is equal to one, two to one eighth note. And then you got 30 seconds, 6 fourth. It gets a lot smaller, much quicker. Uh, half notes are twice the length of a quarter note. Uh, it's just, it's simple like that. Um, I'll get, I'll, I, I haven't tackled rhythm that much. Uh, lately, but if you watch the Melody series, the Melody series should be a little helpful. Um, I've talked about rhythm a little bit there, and actually I'll be having a video coming up soon in that series dedicated to writing melodies by starting with the rhythm. But that's not what this video is about. This video I'm trying to make some progress on the orchestration. So let's get back to that. We have the clarinet, bass clarinet, Ooh, that's a rich sound. I like that. I like that. I like that. Don't think I like it as much as the flute, though. So let's take that out. But we might have use for that later. So if you're just coming to the, ga uh, to the game now, the idea here is I'm redoing my orchestration map since I've got some fresh palettes here, and I want to actually... Like I said, I've said it a couple times in a couple of videos, but these videos haven't really been reflecting my actual process. Mostly because I get interrupted. I have to, I, I'm talking while I do it. I'm trying to explain things as I go. And the biggest limiting factor, I'm only working on this for one hour every week, which normally I like to work much more uh, on a single project. But uh, So what I'm trying to do in this video is give you a bit of a closer look to my actual orchestration process. So here we've mapped out, I've kept the energy map, energy levels for each of these, energy level four. So now what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out what emotion do I want to try and capture, all right? I decided for this initial statement, this one segment, I want it to be a bit somber, I want it to be a bit intimate, I want it to be a bit serious, we're introducing our characters here. So then after that, I brainstormed a couple instruments that could do this. So it was like the trumpet can do it, the flute can do it, the horn, clarinet, piano. These are all good instruments for this tone color. So now I'm just going through and figuring out which of these instruments do I want to work with. Now, first of all, let me see here. We're going to move on to the horn. So the horn in a, for like a solo melodic kind of range, its best range is typically from the F sharp below middle C. Where is it? Oh, it is starting. It has been raining nonstop where I live. Like for the last week, the neighbors are getting angry at my roommate and I for not mowing our lawn, but we can't. It's raining constantly. And we don't have fancy services to do it for us. So, here we go. That has nothing to do with this. Uh, horn solo. So, we've got the horn. Now, the horn's ideal range for melodies. Let's get rid of that. Uh, is going to be between the F sharp below middle C up to about the C above middle C. If you go any lower, it gets a bit flat, it gets a little bit thick and difficult to man uh, to maneuver around melodic lines and maintain the foreground. If you go much higher, oh, would you look at that? It would appear that the library itself has already limited that for us. Let's see here. Yeah, it only goes a little bit higher than an octave above middle. Well, that doesn't seem right. Yep, about now. So this is middle C, I guess. And it only goes up to about an octave higher. So it's already limited that for us. It goes a bit lower than is typical for a solo, horn solo. But, so let's see where this puts us. This, I think means that it probably wouldn't work that well for us. C sharp, because I mean, it's, I guess it goes up to a D, so it would be just in range, so.
Oh my goodness, I'm actually quite enjoying that one a bit. I really like that. That is... Okay, so now it's, I have to decide between do I want that or do I want the alto flute. Both are sound good for the... I think this is a heroic piece. All right, alto flute. I love the sound of the alto flute on this melody, but it is a heroic piece. We want to try and get that heroic um, feel across. Ah, Matt Lewis, when is my book out? Oh, it's out already. Yeah, it's. I'm excited about it. I put it in a video recently. It's doing pretty well. I've gotten some great feedback on it. Right now, all that's available is an audiobook and an ebook version. But uh, thanks to a patron of mine who told me about a website called lulu.com, uh, I've got a physical copy sample coming in uh, any day now that I'll be able to look at, get signed off on. So hopefully, I'll be able to start selling physical copies as well for people who enjoy that. But yeah, it's on my website. You can actually, there's a link in the description of this video if you're interested. Um, it talks about film scoring. It goes into uh, uh, how the nine parameters are used to tell stories. The music, so texture, timbre, uh, rhythm, dynamics, all that kind of stuff. How those, each of those help tell stories. Uh, then it goes into three tools that I've designed uh, to help you uh, really get to better understand emotions uh, better understand story worlds and story characters and how each of those can be then translated into music. All right. So, yes. So, yeah, that's my plug for myself right there. Check it out if you haven't already. There's a book club that uh, actually there's a link on Patreon right now. That the patrons are going to be part of a book club where we're going to discuss it. We're going to record it. And we're all going to have a time talking about it, asking questions, all that good stuff. And then those videos will be uploaded down the line. But so, yeah, if you are one of my patrons and you haven't uh, set up, you, like, uh, use the link on Patreon to say what time works best for you, please get on that. Uh, the more of you that can make it, the better, because I would love to talk with you guys and just explain things and answer any questions or have you guys make me think about stuff. All right, so, uh, and then there were some other things. Uh, Dominique, good afternoon. I hope all is going well with you. Also, I really enjoy watching your videos. I've learned a lot, and I can't wait to see this finished piece. Thank you for that. Thank you, Dominique. I really appreciate it. Glad to have you on here. Uh, I love, I love doing this stuff with you guys. And uh, ah, and thank you, Matt. Matt says that he's excited about the book and is going to get one. Thank you. I appreciate it. All proceeds go towards helping me pay tuition. All right? Because <laughs> that's, um, yeah, <laughs> bills, lots and lots of bills. So, yes, thank you. Every book that you guys get helps make the, uh, makes my financial situation a little bit easier. Uh, but, yes, yeah, so here we go. Horn Solo. I'm really liking this. Here's what we're going to do. I want to give myself a little bit of a count in. Bar offset. Go. Let's see. Do you want to keep the priority? Yes. And look at that. It moved everything and gave us a bar zero. All right. So this will give us a nice count in. I'm going to open that MIDI track. Let's just do a quick recording. Oops, that was, that did not have the click going. There we go. No great shakes at performing, so hopefully I did not just embarrass myself. But let's open this up, make sure that it's all fit. Let's switch to part, so now it's color coded. There we go. Just straighten these out a bit. I could do quantize. I don't know why I'm not using quantize. But I don't know. Give us a little bit more breathing room here. Uh, 
just tidying it up. I'm moving this over here. So what we're going to do now, now that we've got a nice, decent start, and I will really record this, I will polish it up. Whether or not that will be on camera, we'll decide later. Because that would just be really boring for you guys to have to watch me go through, re-record everything, fix stuff, basically like an hour or multiple hours of just stuff like this. Where it's just me lengthening things, clicking on things. Let's give this a quick listen on solo. Turn off the click. There we are. All right, we'll make some changes there, but that's good enough. <clears throat> so, let's see here. We've got this. So now the melody. We know the melody is in solo horn. So now we've got now we've got the background material. All right. So we've got a bass line and chords. The question here is what instruments are going to be complementary yet independent from this horn. So we want to find other voices that can that we know are going to match well with the horn, be complementary to it, but also contribute something new, be independent. Uh, so there are a couple things we can do to consider this. There's a whole lot of stuff we could consider for this too. Uh, a lot of it comes down to experience, but helping out with just like a process for this, we can ask two questions uh, about instrument structure and waveform. All right, so let's look at instrument structure first. So the idea here for instrument structure with orchestrating. We've got our primary material. It's in a solo horn. Let's find instruments that have are either made of the same material or produce their sound the same way. So instrument structure, it's made of metal. Uh, sound produced by air. All right, so now theoretically, just about any instrument that has one or both of these characteristics is going to sound complementary to the horn. Any instrument made of metal is going to have a complementary sound. So trumpet, trombones, tubas, timpani, uh, gongs, all that cool stuff. Those will all go well with a horn. Sounds produced by air. This gets a little bit more subtle. I mean, uh, woodwinds go really well with the horn, and so does the... Yeah, so I guess, yeah, it's not so subtle in this situation. But as the horn is considered, for the longest time, it was actually considered a woodwind and not a brass instrument. At the early days of the orchestra, it was classified as a woodwind. And so today, it's seen as kind of the bridge between woodwinds and brass. So let's see here. We've got instruments that are made of metal, instruments that are produced by air, and anything that's mixed together works really well. So for me, what's ringing right off the bell for me is... Tuba. Tuba on that bass line. So let's take this bass line. We'll just do the old copy and paste for now. Exit that. Let's find a tuba. Not a ch ch uh, chimbasso. Let's do a tuba. Uh, chimbasso and bass trombones also have very low races, uh, rages, uh, ranges. Uh, but they're a bit brighter than what I'm looking for. The horn has a very mellow sound, and so does the tuba, especially at this range. Let's change the velocity here. We get a bit quieter. All right. I think that's good for now because I don't want to add any more brass just yet. I don't. I want to hold off because for the climactic moment, there's going to be a whole lot of brass that we can throw in there. And if we hold off a bit until that moment, then it's going to be even more impactful. So, let's see. Uh, the next thing that we can compare for to find complementary instruments is something called waveform. Ah, oh, I've already typed it down out here. So waveform has to do mostly with the decay of the instrument, but it can be other parts too. So if you've ever seen an ADSR knob on... Actually, let's see if I can pull one up here. Um, let's see here. 
Go to horn. Let's pick up. Uh, let's do hmm. Reverb, reverb, probably. You know what? Let's actually just pull up a synth. It's easier to just show it on the synth. Uh, let's do here. I'll show you EDSR, ADSR. All right, so ADSR has means attack, decay, sustain, and release. Where is it? Here it is. All right. So you know what? Let's not do. Why can't I hear this? Where is it? Ah, yes. Oh, uh, this is a bit confusing. Massive can be intimidating. Let's go with Massive X. Massive X is a little less intimidating. And I actually understand it a bit better. Where is synth? Massive X. All right, so this is this is important to orchestration. Don't worry. It all has to do with something. Let me see here. Uh, yes, Trash Beats. Uh, asking where the book is. Uh, so, tra uh, so the book is on my website. There's a link in the description of this video, actually, that you can use to find it. Right now, it's just an audiobook and an ebook. Uh, but then there's also... Um, um, so yeah, I'm working on getting physical copies in the near future. Um, as a heads up, it is not a music theory book. All right, I I I, I want to make that clear. It's not going in there explaining what different things in music theory are. It expects you to have a bit of an understanding of music theory going in, but it goes through and breaks down how you can translate things into music. So how do you take this character that you want to write a theme for? And take this character, how do you get to know them and understand what parts of this character are the most important traits to turn into music? And not only that, but how can you represent those traits in music? That's more about how it is. So it's a bit of a conceptual book. Uh, I, in the future, I plan on writing some more stuff about, like, some more books about harmony, melody, turn, like, some of my series into some, like, uh, books. But, anywho, let's see here. Um, let's attack and, let's see, let's, let's go to a sine wave. There we go. Let's turn that level down a little bit. Where is it? So it's not so loud. All right, so here we've got attack. A stands for attack. Decay, sustain, and release. All right, so look at this. Uh, so you're going to want to look down here. So this little shape is what we're going to look for. So attack has to do with how long it takes after you hit a note for the sound to reach its peak. All right, so if we make that longer... This leaches out, and you'll see it takes longer to reach its peak volume. The sustain, the decay, shows how long does it take. Well, the sustain is more about a level of, after you hit the peak, where does it come back down to sustain? All right, so you hear that? It's a bit of a swooping noise. I'm going to make it a bit more dramatic. All right, it, comes, it goes loud and comes back down. So sustain is how loud is it once it levels out. The decay is how long does it take to reach that sustain. So it's a short amount of time. Increasing the decay, it takes longer to get back down there. All right, release is after you release the note, how long does it take to die out? So there are, there are some better ways to uh, explain this and... I probably shouldn't have spent too much time uh, on it, but the idea here, the idea here is that that decay, that moment, how long does it take for the note to die out? How long can that be, note be held? There are two different ways that you can describe it for most acoustic instruments. It can be either short versus long and fixed versus variable. All right, so if I am on a piano and I hit a note, it has a short decay. I release it, and it's gone. All right? If I hold it, even if I'm using a pedal, it's longer, but it's still going to decay at a fixed rate. There's nothing I can do to manipulate that. All right? So that would be a fixed and long decay. On brass, theoretically, you can hold it much longer. And on top of that, you can do a lot of stuff with it. You can get quieter. You can get louder and quieter again. That would be a variable decay, where the instrument can control the sound while it's being held. So, all of this to say is let's find a way to describe the horn. The horn is a variable decay, and it could be 
and we'll say long because for this purposes it's long and variable. So hopefully this isn't going all over your heads. I do plan on going a lot more in depth on this when I do my second orchestration series. But so right now the way you find a complementary instrument is you try to figure out does it fit along with like does it have a similar tail? And if not, does it have a contrasting tail? What are you looking for? So right now what I'm looking for is other instruments that can also hold a long note as long as needed, as well as can manipulate it, like the horn can. All right, so the piano, piano is great. I hit that though and I can't do anything to it. I can't change the volume, I can't change the character of it, uh, and I can't keep it from dying out. Not on a regular piano at least. So let's see, variable and long, let's see, strings come to mind, brass and woodwinds. All of these are capable of variable and long decay. I'm going to say no brass because I've already got enough. I'm going to say no woodwinds because if we're already using a brass sound, I want to save the woodwinds for later so that we can evolve a bit, which leaves us with strings to do these chords. Now this is a low energy moment in the music, so let's take these real quick. Well, actually, let's take a look at this. All right, first, first things first, super easy. Let's just take the tuba and we'll double it in the basses. Let's turn on the basses. And we'll let the balance that out in a little bit, but I think that sounds good. Next, uh, this so this horn doesn't go very high. This gives me some couple a couple options. Uh, I could either maintain that the horn is the highest register. All right, nothing is gonna go higher than the melody. In which case, I could do I could split the chords into just cello, the celli and violas. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, most of these are triads. So I would just take whatever note is in the root, in the bass line, and I'd replace it with a note not in the bass line, one of the two remaining not notes, and place one in the cello, celli, one in the uh, uh, violas. That could be cool. Another one could be to open up in this upper register and put the violins on those remaining notes. And there's a lot of cool ambient things we could do for that. But I'm thinking, at least for the beginning, I want to save that high register. That high register going higher than the horn is a great way to help build and grow in the music. So I'm going to save that. So let's see about just doing these in the celli and violas. First, let's figure out what we're working with. So E is in the bass line there. G is in the bass line there. C there. And there's two Cs here. Don't know why. Uh, A is there. So we're just going through and finding all the notes not in the bass line. Um... We all, we're going to make a chord progression with these. There we go. So let's activate some celli. I'm going to close the brass. Let's go with the full celli section right now. Let's see here. Uh, yes, okay, so trash piece. Uh, would, you, uh, would you also classify as a sound selection looking for a sound that will match? Exactly. That's what this is all about. I decided that the melody is going to be in the horns. So what I'm doing now is I'm trying to find out what other material do I have. I've got the bass line and the uh, chords that I need to add here. So I'm trying to find sounds that will complement the horn and help bring out the same kind of emotion I'm looking for. You, this could entirely be done instinctively. All right, I want to say that right now. I like to have structure. I like to have an approach to everything I do so I can rely on it. That's just the way I am. But I am incredibly jealous of people who just have really good instincts and can say, all right, I already know what instruments are playing this. And I imagine that will come with more time for me. I can already do that to a certain degree. Uh, right now I'm trying to explain everything as I go, though. So for that, structure definitely helps. So, yeah, you don't need to use these methods. You don't have to think about instrument structure and waveform. Those aren't necessarily important. That's not going to work for everybody. Um, this is the way I was taught. This is the way that I like to work with it. And I find it very helpful. But yeah, for all intents and purposes, right now, you could just be doing everything by just thinking what sounds good together. All right, here, let's voice lead these lines a little bit. 
Let's bring those bees down. Uh, so we've got a B to a B, G to a D. Oh, man, these are long. So I might have to do some part writing here. Um, or... Let's see here. <laughs> See there. So yeah, let's focus on just getting one line. All right, this is a mess. All right, let's look for common tones first. All right, B to B, E to E, B to B. Those are all our common tones. So let's just, those are staying there. All right, so now we've got G to D. Then to E to E. Let's see here. And then. All right, so we've got some large leaps here. Uh, so with that, let's check and see what bass lines we got. All right, so. E to G. So E would definitely work here. So let's say what we're going to do, we're going to cut this, we're going to bridge these gaps. All right, we're spinning blue circle. There we go. Bring this down to E to help bridge that. We got a C to C fit between these two. No, but G to B is a third. That's fine. G to C sharp, however. So let's do, let's cut this. A, then A to C sharp is a third. That's more permissible. Uh, any other large leaps? B, D to G, let's see if we can lower that a bit. So, yep, we can definitely do that. All right, E. B to D is fine. That's fine. So let's lower this. Give us a sound. Hold up. All right, Shelly, these are using legato, aren't they? Remember, the difference between legato and sustained is legato uh, in most sound libraries is monophonic. You can only play one note at a time. So we switch to sustains. There we go. I like that. Let's take this, cut it. We will take this top line and just place it in the violas. So let's activate the violas. I might go for a smaller. I might like the six celli and six violas instead. We'll see. Sorry, just taking a quick drink. Uh oh, the computer's starting to have it. <laughs> oh, my poor computer. It's too many contact instances. All right, if you are working with contact, a little fun fact. See here, 188.58 megabytes or megabits or whatever they're called. I'm not a computer whiz. Update sample pool. Bam! Cut that down by a large amount. Basically, every instrument has a just a huge amount of audio files that it's required. Let's see if actually we can take a look at this. Um, I actually don't know if we'll be able to. Um, no, yeah, they're probably not going to let us look at it. Mapping editor. Uh, oh, yeah, here. Okay, so each of these, every single one of these things here is a different group. And each of these groups contain a bunch of audio files. This is why... Things like Spitfire's uh, professional studio here. I have over 500 gigabytes on this computer just between these three libraries alone. And it's because they have so many audio files that are required to go with it. So, of course, you are not always going to be using every single one of those audio files. So by doing update sample pool, 
it reduces it to only the ones you're using. It's a nice little trick for saving your computer some RAM space when working with a bunch of files. Let's see strings here. All right, here we go. Update sample pool. Yeah, see that one from 400 down to 40 or so. This is going from 236 to 5. Look at that. That should help my computer quite a bit. Let's give this a listen to. I like that. Uh, it definitely needs to be balanced way better. And I can take care of that relatively quickly. Of course, the one thing missing here is percussion. As you notice, my template has nothing in it. There are no percussion instruments. That's because I like to do percussion last, unless I've got a very specific idea of what I'm working with. And I just prefer to load the instruments as needed. So let's see what time is it 348 yeah let's let's do a quick level of this let's show off some cool things that cubase can do all right so cubase can let's go to articulations and dynamics i should have yes a an expression map loaded already expression maps to my knowledge are unique to cubase you have to make them yourself i made every single one of these expression it is a tedious tedious uh, process, but worth it because once you make it, you have them forever. Now I'll demonstrate this a little bit. So expression map setup. So you go here. Basically, I go through and I assign a key switch to each of these. So what is this? Horn solo two. Yes, horn solo two and Spitfire audio already has key switches set up. This means that if you're playing on a full-sized keyboard, naturally the horn doesn't take up the entire keyboard. So the very lowest notes on the MIDI keyboard, the C negative 2, C sharp negative 2, and all that, when you press them while you play, it'll trigger a different type of expression. So there's a specific note on the keyboard I can hit to make all my other notes sound legato. Same for staccatissimo, tenuto, marcato, all these different things. And I basically set this up so that I don't need to do that. I built all these maps for my libraries so that I could do something like this. Hit legato, and now everything that this horn plays will sound legato. Um, so yes, actually do this, unsolo everything. Let's start with the horns. And why is it doing this? Oh, that's why. Why is it... All right, I guess, yeah. And one other thing we can do. And I'll probably change some articulations here, but this, to make it work, let's take send volume, and we'll do modulation for now. So what this does is I now get to set a dynamic for this. I want this entire passage to be performed in forte. What I can do from here, the dynamics mapping, so you just click on that, let me show you how to get there if you've got Cubase. Click on Articulations. Articulations dynamics are highlighted. Go down to Dynamics Mapping. Here I can set what percentages I want to do. Uh, so for volume, for Tissius ESEMO, it looks like is 100%. The loudest this instrument can get is at that point. So at Forte, it's about a 70%. About 70% of what this instrument is capable of. Velocity, this has to do with how hard I want to hit each note. I try not to change velocities. Uh, controller. I can send this to any controller I want. Modulation, in most sound libraries, what that is, is it tells the instrument, it modulates between different sample types. So not only do we have this file for G, but we've got about four or five others, typically, of different ways that the same note was played. And on top of that, we've got that repeated for different volume levels. Because the horn sounds very different. Okay, I'm not on the horn, apparently. It sounds very different when it's quiet than when it's super loud. And so the modulation helps us mark through that a bit uh, and muddle through it and make it sound more realistic. So 
So that's still super quiet. All right, let me see here. Anything else? Yes, so Trash Beats, would you, uh, is, uh, I like your method and process of creating music. I'm learning. Thank you. I'm glad. That's why I'm doing this. Uh, so when voicing, we have to avoid perfect voice and parallel fits, correct? Okay, so the big word there is have to. Some teachers will tell you, yes, you must avoid those at all costs, and the answer is no. No, you don't have to. Uh, it depends on what genre you're working with. If you are writing classical music and you want to be, like, prim and proper, follow all the rules of music theory, then yes, you typically want to avoid perfect fifth and perfect octave and perfect fourth intervals. The reason being that those can remove some of the independence between your lines. So let's go back to our piano for an example. If we were to do... All right, those two sound like individual lines, even more so if I do this. All right, so pretty dissonance. But you see here, there's movement in between each line. Sounds like two lines there. If they're both moving by perfect fifths. Then it sounds a bit more like a chord. Same with the perfect fourth octaves. They sound more like one voice than two, and the more you do it, the more dramatic and impactful that will have. So really the idea is, what kind of sound do you want to go for? Do you want to go for an independent voice between each line in the harmony? If so, try to avoid them. If not, then don't worry about it. I actually talk about this a lot more in depth in my harmony, and I think it's the very first video in the harmony series. So if you want to revisit that it's the harmony of the major key and voice leading, I think. It's the introduction. I go through some actual very simple and useful practical rules that you can use to maintain proper voice leading if that's what your goal is. Uh, and if not, I also mention that too. So I would check that out. Uh, let's see here. So we've got the horns going. The horns are still a bit quiet for my liking, but before I mess with any of that, I'm going to start by first manipulating the dynamics of everything else. So let's let's do mezzo piano. Make sure that this is working. Don't want to change my velocities. Which is what I prefer. That sounds much more balanced. Let's try these. And again, this isn't my final thing. All right, I'm just looking at the moment to make everything sound good enough. And that's the name of the game at the beginning. Just get everything to sound good enough that you can hear and understand what your vision is and how things are going to turn out. And then, down the line, you can start getting more fussy and focusing a lot more on the details. So I'll do some more modulation on this stuff. I'll do some more specific shifts here and there. But for now, I just want to make sure I've got the bases. This is always annoying to me. Anytime you copy or paste something, which I know you're not supposed to, or really you shouldn't do too much copying and pasting if you want it to sound uh, you uh, like authentic. But it annoys me that when you copy and paste it, it tells me that this is from the tuba line. You know, it's in the bases. I mean, I suppose it's got its value. But let's see here. Mezzo piano again. Dynamics mapping. Send to volume. Send to controller. That controller I want to send to is modulation. Yeah, my computer kind of crapped out on me on that, but there we go. That's a decent sketch so far for the first section. So from here, the next thing I'm going to want to do is I want to move on to A2, which the idea is how am I going to grow from here? One thing I can say almost guaranteed is I'm going to have the same bass line, tuba and strings. Um... I might start branching out a bit more. I'm definitely doubling this melody on something. The melody, the foreground is very important to develop if you want to keep things from sounding similar, or uh, like repetitive. The background, you can you can be a little more repetitive with the background because again, that's supportive. It provides context, and the context doesn't need to change all that much. But the foreground should always be shifting from phrase to phrase. That's how your music grows and develops. 
Now, we don't have enough time to move on to that, but I think this is a good spot to stop, so I'm going to save it here. And next video, now that we've got established this process, it should go a bit quicker. Next video, we'll try to do A2 and B1, preferably, if we can get everything done. Um, and then, yeah, just move along, move along, and get this orchestrated as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Let's see, uh, are there any other questions? I will, I'll stay on for a couple more minutes. we got like three more minutes until the end of the hour, but I'll stay on for a little bit longer. Set it my way. I, I, mean, I always love talking with you guys on here. Um, let's see. I'm sorry, I'm drinking Pedialyte at the moment. I like, uh, I've got a, I've uh, got a workout with a friend later, and I have not been hydrated lately, so I'm trying to do damage control. Uh, let's see. Doesn't look like anything's coming. Uh, is it frozen? Did my live stream freeze? Cause I'm seeing it is frozen here. That would really suck if it was frozen. I don't think it's frozen, because there's six of you on here, it says. Um, hmm. We'll see. Anywho, I'll only be on for another minute or so. But, uh, yeah, while I'm waiting, let's just play around with some stuff. What are some instruments I don't usually get to work with? I always work with the with the horns, but let's do it. Why not? Let's try here. Um, frozen. Okay, yeah, Sagar saying it's frozen. That's really, really gonna suck if it was frozen this entire time. All right. All right, looks like it may have frozen. That really sucks. Anywho, if anyone's watching, thank you for staying this long. Uh, I hope it was helpful. All right, I will see you all next week. Hopefully it was not frozen this entire time. Uh, and end.